Welcome everybody to another opening analysis. Today we're going over the Volga Gambit, which is also known as the Banco Gambit. The reason I chose to make a video about this opening is because Volga is actually the name of a river in Russia, and this is part of the Team Seas initiative that was started by Mr. Beast and Mark Rober, which I'll talk all about in the end of the video, because for anyone who wants to learn this opening, I don't want to delay that. So without any further ado, let's begin. The Banco Gambit is after 1d4, uh, knight to f6, c4, and now c5, and they push d5, trying to get a very solid center. And you don't want this, so you immediately attack their center with the move b5. This is the gambit part um, of the bank gambit, because if they take, they're simply up a pawn, and there's no simple way for you to recapture this pawn. Now, here you're going to continue with the move a6. I will also, I should add, mention uh, later in the video what happens if they don't take, um, but almost always they're going to end up taking here. You continue with a6, and it might seem a little scary to play this because once they take their, your second pawn and they trade this pawn, they're going to be up a pawn for good, right? In this position, although they are up a pawn, these two pawns are weak and there are going to be chances for you to attack them. The second you trade another pawn off the board, um, you're getting rid of their current weakness and so it might seem, seem scary that you're never going to win back their pawn. However, one thing you might notice is that suddenly you have two semi-open files, the A and B files. And so even though you're down a pawn, you're going to get so much play on the queen side um, that that's going to be more than enough compensation for that pawn that you're down. And so something like this will continue typically knight to c3. Here you, here you play the move d6. And one of the things to notice, e6 is not really a move that you play in these lines because your bishop doesn't really want to develop here. It would much rather come to g7, where, again, with the help of your rook, you're going to have a lot of pressure on the queen side. And so uh, here, d6 makes sense, followed by, uh, well, you can do this trade if they allow it, but ultimately g6 and developing your bishop. And notice here, it's going to take white quite a lot of time uh, to get out of this situation. And in that meantime, you're going to follow um, a, a developing and castling scheme that you're practically going to employ in every one of these games, which is g6, bishop to g7, castles, and now where does this knight go? There are cases, and we'll actually look at a line where the knight develops from a6 and it can come to b4, a very nice square for it, but typically you're going to want to go to d7, and the idea with going to d7 is that you're going to be controlling more of these central dark squares on e5, and again, you'll see how this comes into play. And once you do control this square, then there's chances for you to come to d3, perhaps with the support of the c4 pawn, or perhaps just going straight to c4. And again, your knight, um, along with your bishop and your rooks and queens, will add a lot of pressure on the queen side. The queen side is essentially the area of the board that you are targeting. And so here they have a number of choices. We can begin with bishop e3. Here you can continue with something like queen a5, transferring your queen over to the queen side and then continue with rook to b8, right? Setting up your rooks and queens uh, to target over here on the a and b file. Now, how do you proceed in a position like this? Because it seems like it's a little hard as black to add more pressure. But here you can continue with something like knight to g4. Um, one idea is perhaps to just trade off this bishop. Um, but a secondary idea in some lines is to, again, move the knight to e5. You never really want to play knight to e5 immediately because then they can take, and then your pawn on e5 is blocking your bishop. Um, this is one of the biggest pieces here in this opening. So instead, you want to play knight g4, and then if they were to take, you have another knight you can recapture with. And so that's typically the idea. So knight to g4, and here black decided to take, which is, again, totally fine. And another idea. And now you're the only one with this dark square bishop, so black really cannot um, oppose your, your control over the dark squares. And with the help of the rook, um, which I have highlighted here, you have a lot of pressure um, on this position. So something like rook takes b2 is actually already possible um, for some nice tactical reasons. If they take rook takes, then bishop takes c3, um, and of course you're winning, and if instead they take queen takes, well, same thing, but, sorry, if they take queen takes, then same thing, bishop takes, and once again, you're winning, um, and this all stems from the pressure that you built up with your bishop, with your rooks, um, and you have a very solid position. Let's see a, some different lines where actually your knights 
um, will also come into the attack. So if we kind of go back to here, um, um, or actually all the way here, if they, instead of playing bishop a3, let's say play queen to c2, um, and they don't want to allow you to trade off their bishop, at least not yet, they want to maintain the bishop here, perhaps defending the pawn, or maybe once your queen develops, they want to have that bishop um, be able to attack your queen, so they want to be more flexible with their development. Well, now you can continue with queen to a5 anyways, and if they do play bishop d2, it doesn't really bother you. You can play the move c4. And now you're not actually going to use your knights uh, only through e5, but now you also have the ability to go knight to c5, where, again, this d3 square is looking very good. So if white plays a4 here, you continue knight to c5, and now there's another weak, weakened square that is introduced. So although they are uh, supporting one of their pawns very nicely now, they've also made a lot of weaknesses on these light squares, and suddenly knight to b3 is a pretty major idea. Knight to d3 also uh, looks quite solid. You can get your rook onto the b-file. Your other knight can also join the attack, which would also allow your bishop to join the attack. And I mean, this other knight, once you put one knight on d3, the other one can travel, for example, to b3. You're going to have a total grasp on the position. And even though uh, you are down a pawn, black is the only one that has the initiative here. And so there's cases where you're not going to win back your pawn, but in all of these lines, one common theme, black is the one attacking, black is the one pushing, um, you have the initiative, um, and that is something very valuable. Now let's keep going and look at a third line here. So in this position, instead of the move queen to c2, instead of the move bishop e3, there is also the move a4 immediately. And a4 is a typical and typically a good move for white to try because it tries to kind of block some of the power you have on the A file. Sometimes they also match this up with the move B3. Um, but here you continue really in not much of a different fashion. Perhaps on A5, the queen is a little less powerful because again, uh, the, the A file is more blocked. So maybe the queen can come to B6. In other lines, it could have gone to B6 as well. And for the most part, you're gonna continue in a normal fashion. Here I can show you another idea that black has, which like I mentioned, is, uh, is coming into the attack via e5. So, you know, we've looked at coming through c5, but e5 is another valuable square for you. Um, and something like knight takes, knight takes, leaves you in a very good position. Your knight can come to multiple squares, all look good. And like I mentioned earlier, c4 um, is a good idea here. And then knight to d3, totally possible, or simply knight to c4 and immediately going uh, for the attack on the dark squares. And of course, your, your bishop's also going to open up. So uh, something like rook a2 here, um, trying to get out of the line of fire of the bishop. And you can continue with knight to d3. Um, say they attack your knight, you can come knight to b4. Uh, and, and this is obviously a fork, you're totally winning. And it's actually kind of hard to play this uh, as, bl as white. I mean, you are putting pressure um, on this pawn. Like I said, they cannot come to c2. And let's say they try to go to b1, for example, then suddenly c4 comes. And you're basically just saying white is totally trapped and stuck. They have nothing they can do. And your next moves are basically just going to be rook b8, perhaps if, if need be, stacking your rooks as well. And you're just going to add more and more uh, power on this uh, pawn and on this uh, file and diagonal. And you're totally winning. And of course, you're also staying quite flexible. There's also chances to reroute the knight. Um, but but if, if I'm being honest, probably you're just going to win this game by going after b2 here. And so overall, this is a really fun, uh, a, a really fun opening for anyone who really likes to attack and have the initiative. Um, and I, I think that, you know, it will teach you a lot about queenside attacks, which perhaps are, are less common and less easy um, for new players or, or just players who play at e4 and e5 a lot, for example, um, because often you attack the king, you attack the king side and you know how to attack the king side well, but attacking the queen side where there is no king is also an important skill and I think this opening does a great job of teaching you that. Now I want to talk to you guys about Team Seas, which is an initiative that aims to clean the waters in this world, like the oceans, the rivers, the lakes, from all the trash that exists within them. Their main goal is to raise $30 million that will allow them 
to take out 30 million pounds of trash from the world. And it's just a wonderful initiative to combine all the efforts of everybody. Um, you probably will see this type of Team Seeds uh, trend on all of the different videos and all of the different channels on YouTube. And if you're interested in helping yourself, then go to teamseas.org where you can uh, contribute to this amazing mission um, and you can also track how the mission is going. And I should add, there's also some nice merch that you'll be able to buy that will also help with this mission. So thank you guys for watching this video. Hopefully you enjoyed it and hopefully you'll help out with Team Seas and I'll see you next time. Peace out.